So I'm actually going to start in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, with verses 39 through 45, and then we'll go into a continuation of that, verses 46 through 56. Now this tells the story of when Mary, the mother of Jesus, she had just learned that she was going to have a baby, so she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, you will hear Elizabeth's response, and then you will hear Mary's response. Hear this word of God. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greetings, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women! And blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Now we continue. Here's what Mary said back. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her, Elizabeth, about three months and then returned to her home. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you and of great value to your people. For it is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. good morning. It is good to see you this morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord together with you. Good to be celebrating these weeks of Advent, that time of the year that the church has set aside to prepare ourselves for the coming of the Christ child. Good to be together. It, it has occurred to me that in, in the times that we have shared so far since my arrival here at St. Mark's that there is a little bit of information that I have, have not quite shared with you yet, and I thought especially with Christmas coming and all, it, it might be nice if I would share a little bit more about myself. And what I'm referring to in particular is my, my ancestry, my heritage. You see, about, I don't know, four generations ago or so, my ancestors immigrated to the United States from Norway. They settled up in the northern part of the United States and uh, raise their families there. And, and because of that, I am privileged to be able to tell some of the deep and meaningful historical stories of my people. And I'm referring specifically to Oli and Lena jokes. Now, if you've never heard about Oli and Lena, Oli and Lena live up in the Northland. Sometimes you hear about them in Wisconsin, Minnesota, maybe the Dakotas, which is where I grew up. But Oli and Lena share this, this wonderful, profound experience of life, and we have so much that we can learn from them. For example, not long ago, Lena went to her husband, Oli, and Lena said, Now, dear Oli, it's the Christmas time, you know, so we got to go and do the Christmas shopping. I wonder if you would come with me and all the girls. We're going to go and do the Christmas shopping, see if we can find the bargains. And Ollie says, oh, no, now, Lena, I already got a, a commitment. Me and my best buddy, Sven, we going to go and go ice fishing. Okay, now we need to take a little sidestep here because you need to understand that up in the northern states, the water gets stiff. 
Okay, we only think it's cold here in El Paso. It gets really cold up there. And you can go ice fishing. You can actually go out on the lake. When the ice gets thick enough, you drill a hole, you go fishing through the hole in the ice. Okay, you have to understand this or the joke doesn't work. Okay, so just, just know that part. So, Oli and his friend Sven, they go out to go ice fishing. They drive their truck out onto the middle of the big lake. They make the hole in the ice. They drop down their lines. They set up their little ice hut and turn on their propane heater. And they're just fishing away, having a good old time. But oh my goodness, the ice wasn't as thick as they thought it was. And all of a sudden, there's a big crack and a splash. And Oli and Sven and their truck and their fishing poles and the whole kit and caboodle goes down into this icy water curse splash they're fighting and struggling to save their lives coming up for air out of the water they make their way over to the shore of the lake and pull themselves up freezing with icicles dripping off their faces and they lie gasping for breath on the shore and Oli turns to his buddy Sven and says dare now see isn't this much better than going Christmas shopping <laughs> They get worse. <laughs> they do. But we can laugh at the story because there's an element of truth behind it. It's that time of year. It's that time of year, the time that, that the church has set aside to prepare for Christmas. We call it Advent. But the time that our culture has set aside for Christmas, that we, they, I don't know what exactly the culture calls it, but, but we know that it's a special time because the, the song tells us so. You can, you can sing with me. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Yay, you just don't look like you buy it. <laughs> and I don't blame you because our culture fills in that word wonderful. If we were to take that word out and just leave a blank there, we could fill that in with a whole lot of other words, couldn't we? It's the most stressful time of the year, most fattening time of the year, the chilliest time of the year, the most expensive time of the year, the most well-decorated time of the year, the most red and green time of the year. It's the time when there are the most uh, children's programs and activities around and therefore it can be the noisiest time of the year there are a whole lot of different ways that we can fill in that blank and we need to choose how we're going to do that so I wonder what would happen if we considered that during this season of preparations during this most wonderful time of the year, what if we could consider that time itself is one of our gifts? The very hours in our day are a gift that God has given us in this season and all seasons, a gift that we don't have to wait until December 25th to open, a gift that we can open up right now and realize how precious and special of a gift it truly is. Imagine how that could change our attitude and our perception of these weeks leading up to Christmas Day. What if we considered that every single hour of every single day is a gift from God that we get to choose how we use it? Now, I know, I know, there are certain things that we have to do. We still have to go to work, and we have to go to school, and we have to eat and sleep and do the laundry. But the fact of the matter is that every one of us has been given 24 hours of every day. And at least some of those hours, we get to make a choice as to how we're going to use them. Now, considering that, it seems to me that the very best example, biblically, of how we would use these weeks leading up to Christmas, how we would use this gift of time, seems to me that the best example is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Our culture would have us believe that we're supposed to be filling this time with all sorts of festivities and things to do. We should be shopping and decorating and cleaning and cooking. We should be going to programs. The calendar gets full. 
The calendar gets filled with children's programs and parties and Christmas programs and there's movies and TV specials to watch. There's a whole list of things to be done. But when you look at Mary, she didn't spend her time preparing for the very first Christmas by taking advantage of Cyber Monday. She spent her time in a much different way. Listen to what the scripture says. Listen one more time. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Mary didn't spend her time baking Christmas cookies. Mary devoted her time to people and to God. Mary devoted her time to people. She went to the home of Elizabeth. Now, many of you probably know that Mary and Elizabeth had a very special relationship. They were literally related. Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. I can hear you tentatively. Cousins. I knew they were cousins. You're right. They were cousins. Elizabeth was Mary's cousin, her much older cousin who recently had learned that she herself was going to be having a baby. Elizabeth was expecting a baby boy, a boy who grew up and who we read about in the Gospels as John, John the baptizer, John who prepared the people for the coming of the Lord, John who told the people, change your ways, change your heart, get ready because Jesus is coming John who actually baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. It is John the baptizer who leaps in Elizabeth's womb when Mary arrives at the door to visit her cousin. This is where Mary chooses to spend her time. She chooses to come to her elderly expectant cousin. We have these two women, Mary who has never been with a man and, and Elizabeth who never thought that she was going to have children and here they are, both going through all of the feelings and emotions, the questions and the joys, the concerns, the fear that accompanied waiting for your firstborn child. Now the Bible doesn't tell us specifically why Mary felt such an urgency to go spend time with her cousin Mary, but it's not too hard for us to imagine. By going to Elizabeth's house, Mary can get away from the gossiping tongues in her own town. By going to Elizabeth's house, Mary, the unwed young girl, can spend her time with someone who, more than anyone else in the world, is able to relate to her situation. I can imagine the two of them chit-chatting as they're preparing a little nursery place in Elizabeth's home, telling stories about, so what was it like for your family when an angel dropped by? I can imagine them comparing notes about, what do you think this childbirth thing is going to be like? You know, in first century Israel, it was not, not a, an, a pleasant thing to think about. A lot of women lost their lives during childbirth. You can just know that they've got to be telling, well, so-and-so said it's like this, and so-and-so said it's like that. We have young, strong, energetic Mary who's there to help Elizabeth do all the preparations she needs to do, and wise Elizabeth who's able to counsel and nurture young Mary as they wait for this precious time. Mary chose to spend her time devoted to a person. She could have stayed at home fussing and fuming about her own circumstance, but no, instead she went to Elizabeth, a person who needed some help, a person who could feed her own soul. But that time together that they spent did not just happen automatically. Mary intuitively understood the need to reach out to another. But she had to intentionally use her time to make that happen. It's not so much different with our own Christmas season. 
If we're going to use our time to devote to people and to devote to God, we're going to have to make some choices. We're going to have to very intentionally set apart our time for family and friends. If we don't do that, December 25th will come and go. Before we know it, it'll be over and we'll be thinking, I never even got to spend time with the people who mean the most to me. So this Christmas season, set aside time for people. Reach out to someone who's in need a little bit. Spend some time with your family. Spend some time with your kids. Just sit back and watch your children playing. Read the Christmas story to your children or to your grandchildren. Share a cup of coffee. Make a phone call to someone you haven't talked to for a while. Turn off those wonderful Christmas specials and just talk to your family for a few minutes. Find out what they're thinking during this Christmas season. The gift of time is something that if we invest it into the people God has given us in our lives, it can make a tremendous, tremendous difference for all of us. One of the most memorable traditions that our family had as our children were growing up was that each night before bedtime in those weeks leading up to Christmas, we would celebrate the Advent calendar. We had a, a little tree that was cut out of wood in the, you know, a piece of wood that was cut in the shape of a tree, and we had drilled little holes in it, and into each little hole we had tapped a little short little piece of dowel stick. There were 24 of them, one for each day, December 1st through December 24th. We had taken gummy lifesavers, you know, the little candies, and put two of them on every little stick, one for each child. And then every night between December 1st and Christmas Eve, we would gather for a few minutes. We would read maybe a sentence or two out of the Christmas story in the Bible. We would share best and worst, which means we'd go around and everybody took turns saying, what's the best thing that happened today and what's the worst thing that happened today? We would uh, sing a little song, say a little prayer, and then the children would get to take those two gummy lifesavers and each of them would eat one of those little gummy lifesavers. Didn't take more than 10 or 15 minutes out of our day. And let me tell you, by the time December 24th arrived, those lifesavers were hard as rocks and dusty. I don't even want to talk about that. But you know, they seemed to build up good immunities. It was all right. But those special little 10-minute blocks of time are something that our children will remember for their entire lives. It just took a little tiny bit of thought, and we created a way to invest our time into our family during the weeks leading up to Christmas. That's what Mary did. She used her time to devote to people, and she used her time to devote to God. That second portion of scripture that we read where Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Some of the most beautiful, beautiful words in the entire Bible. Mary intentionally takes some time to set aside to devote to God. To tell God how much she loves him. To give God praise and glory and adoration. To tell the story of what God has done for her and what God has done for other people. She takes that moment to say, Lord, this is so amazing. What if we could do that? If we could set aside some of that precious gift of time and just devote it completely to God. And you're already doing that because you're here in worship this morning. Look at you. Look at you using your time so wisely. But you don't want that to end when you walk out the door of the building. You want to continue valuing this precious gift of time and give it to God. And you know, it's not so much a, a matter of what you're doing with your time, but it's how you're doing the things that you do. 
You know, if, if decorating your house and putting up lots of bright lights and shiny trees and ornaments, if that just helps you to remember the glory of God and how the light of Jesus shines into the world, if that helps you to, to praise and worship God and to turn your home into a sanctuary, then you should decorate your house big. But if by the time you get done putting up the tree, your children are no longer speaking to each other, that's not so much a God time anymore. If writing Christmas cards is a way that helps you to think about and nurture in your heart the relationships with people that you've uh, met throughout your life and you can share a word of comfort and joy to those people, then you should write out as many Christmas cards as you want to. But if doing Christmas cards is another thing that's on your list of stuff you have to do before Christmas, and as you're writing out those cards, you're thinking, I can't believe I have to write a card to her because her card was really snippy to me, and I just don't even... It's no longer a God time. If, if shopping is a, a special family tradition that you go and you spend some time together and, and just enjoy each other's company and it fills you with glory and warmth and friendship, then go shopping. But if going shopping for Christmas just plunges you deeper into debt and makes you stressed for the next six months, then think about a different way to spend your time before Christmas. Put your time into God and into God's people. Do not allow the expectations of our culture to rob from you the joy of this season of the celebration of the birth of our Savior. View your time as something that is so precious that you will not allow anyone to steal it from you in a way that creates harm to your family or to other people or to your own soul and your relationship with God. If you don't do this, then on Christmas Day, you're going to be sitting there just listing all of the things that you've done. You don't want to spend Christmas Day saying, and I saved 40% at this store, and I baked 75,000 dozens of cookies, and I did. You don't want to be doing that. On Christmas Day, you want to be saying, wow, I really grew deeper in my relationship with the people around me and with God who has given me the Christ child as my Savior. But the only way that you can do that is to make a few changes in how you view your time. And it might even mean that some of those things that are filling up your calendar, you might have to say no to. Not anything at church. Do everything that the church does. <laughs> Just kidding. But truly, you might have to think about, is this adding to the deep sense of connection with God that this season is intended for? Or do I need to change my schedule just a little bit in order to create time that is meaningful in the way that God wants it to be? That song, it's the most wonderful time. You get to take that word wonderful and you get to fill in that blank however you want to. You get to sing the song, it's the most stressful time in the year, or it's the most peaceful time in the year. Are you going to sing it, it's the most expensive time of the year, or it's the time that fills my soul the most? How are you going to fill in that blank of that song? How are you going to use your time in preparation for the birth of the Christ child? You have been given a gift. Don't wait till December 25th to open it. Open the gift of time now. Use it for people. Use it for God. And experience Christ this Christmas. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.